I walked out of my marriage after my husband invited his sister and her husband to live with us without asking. Now I'm finally reclaiming my life. My name's Sarah, and I'm 38 years old. Up until recently, life had been pretty good. I work as an investor and day trader, making a comfortable living from home. I've got a congenital health condition, which isn't life-threatening but means I have to be cautious and not push myself too hard. I've gotten used to living a careful, controlled life because of it. Then there's Jake, my husband, who's 32. Yeah, I know he's younger than me by a solid six years, but it never seemed like a problem between us. We met at a restaurant where he worked as a waiter. At first, he was just the cute guy who brought me my food, and we'd exchange small talk. Over time, we became friends. You know how these things go. You start casually chatting, then suddenly you're hanging out, meeting outside the restaurant, and before long, things got serious between us. Jake was sweet, attentive, and genuinely seemed to care about me. When he proposed the idea of marriage, I hesitated at first. I mean, I wasn't sure I could have kids because of my health issues, and I didn't want him to feel like he was missing out on that part of life. But Jake reassured me. If I wanted kids, I'd be with someone else, he told me once. At the time, it felt like comfort. He was saying he just wanted to be with me, not some ideal family life with kids. So I believed him. We got married, and for the first couple of years, everything seemed great. He was still working as a waiter, but after a while he suggested staying home and taking care of things around the house while I focused on my work. Wouldn't it be easier if I took care of everything here so you could focus? He'd say, and honestly, it sounded perfect. Jake loved cooking, and he always talked about how he wanted to open his own restaurant someday. I thought, hey, maybe this could be a way for him to experiment with food while managing our home. In the beginning, it was amazing. I'd walk out of my home office, and everything would be spotless. Dinner would be ready, and it just felt like life was smooth. I focused on making money, and Jake was happy doing what he loved. It felt like a win-win for both of us. But slowly, things started to shift. It wasn't an overnight change, but I began to notice little things. The house wasn't as clean as it used to be. Dishes would pile up in the sink. I'd step out of my office at the end of the day and see random clutter everywhere. Jake, who had been meticulous about keeping everything neat, seemed to let things slide more and more. He started spending most of his time on his computer playing video games. Now, I'm not against gaming. Everyone needs a hobby, right? But it wasn't just an hour or two after dinner. It was all night. He'd stay up until 4 or 5 a.m., sleep during the day, and his entire routine shifted. I tried to bring it up casually at first. Hey, the house is a bit of a mess. Can we figure something out? Jake would apologize, but in a way that didn't feel real. I'm just really into this new game. I'll get back to cleaning soon, I promised. But soon never came. He finished that game, moved on to another, and the mess remained. I started feeling like I was living with a roommate instead of a husband. He was physically there, but mentally and emotionally, it felt like he was a million miles away. Dinner, which had once been our time to connect, became another lonely part of the day. Jake started eating in front of his computer, saying, I've got a raid tonight. I'll eat later. But later never happened, and I'd find myself eating alone. I know it sounds small, but those dinners alone hurt. I miss sitting down after a long day, talking about whatever had happened, laughing together. Now I was just staring at cold leftovers while Jake disappeared into his online world. Even when I went to bed, I'd go alone. He stayed up playing, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night, still hearing the clicking of his keyboard from the other room. It wasn't just about the mess or the lack of attention. It felt like he wasn't present anymore. He'd leave the house for hours, saying he was running errands, but when I asked where he'd gone, he'd shrug it off like it didn't matter. I tried not to nag. I didn't want to be that wife who was constantly asking for details, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I'd see him coming back with bags of random stuff, nothing I'd ever asked for, and it all started to add up, this growing distance between us that I didn't know how to bridge. For months, I let it go. I kept hoping things would get better, that maybe this was just a phase. But nothing changed. I was working, providing for both of us, while Jake was slipping further and further away into his own little world. I felt like I was married to a ghost. I'd stare at the closed door of our bedroom, his bedroom now, since he'd moved into the guest room to have more space to game, and wonder where the man I fell in love with had gone. One night I snapped. I'd been sitting in the living room, surrounded by the mess that had taken over our house. Clothes thrown everywhere, dirty dishes stacked in the sink, a half-eaten sandwich sitting on the coffee table. It hit me that this wasn't the life I signed up for. I married Jake because I thought we were in this together, but now it felt like I was the only one who cared. The next morning, I couldn't hold it in any longer. I walked into Jake's bedroom, where he was still passed out from another late-night gaming session, and said we need to talk. He groaned and pulled the blanket over his head. Can it wait? I'm tired, no, I said firmly. It can't wait. I'm tired too. 
Tired of feeling like I'm doing this marriage alone, that got his attention. He sat up, rubbing his eyes. What are you talking about? I'm here, aren't I? Physically, yeah. But you're not here, Jake. You stay up all night playing games. The house is a mess, and I feel like I'm living with a teenager, not a husband. He looked embarrassed for a second, then defensive. It's not like I don't do anything. I cook. I clean. You act like I'm just sitting around all day. Because you are, Jake. You wanted to stay home so I could focus on work, but I'm doing everything. You need to start acting like a partner, not just someone who happens to live here. That Jake didn't have much to say after that. He muttered something about getting it together. But I could tell by the look on his face that nothing was going to change. And sure enough, for a few days he made an effort. He cleaned up the living room and cooked dinner, but it felt half-hearted. The meals were rushed, and the cleaning was surface level at best. It was like he was doing just enough so I wouldn't complain, but not enough to make any real difference. And the gaming? That never stopped. Every night it was the same thing. He'd say, just one more level, but that level would turn into hours. I'd go to bed alone and he'd still be up when I woke up for work the next morning. I couldn't help but feel invisible. It wasn't even about the chores anymore. It was the fact that Jake wasn't present in our marriage. We never talked about anything real. We'd gone from being partners to being two people who just happened to share a house. I missed him, but I didn't know how to reach him anymore. As if things between Jake and me weren't already strained enough, the situation took a turn I never saw coming. One evening I was sitting at my desk, working late as usual, when Jake came into my office. He looked more serious than I had seen him in a long time, and I could tell right away that something was up. We need to talk, he said, his tone heavy. My stomach dropped. I had heard that phrase from him before, and it never led to anything good. I turned away from my computer and took a deep breath. Okay, what's going on? He hesitated, glancing down at the floor before finally saying, My sister Karen and her husband Mike. They're moving in with us. Starting today. I blinked, unsure if I had heard him right. Wait, what? Moving in? Today. They're having financial problems, he explained, like that would somehow make this easier to digest. They can't pay rent anymore and they need a place to stay. I told them they could stay with us for a while. My brain struggled to keep up with what he was telling me. He had told them they could just move in, without even asking me first. I felt my heart racing as frustration bubbled up inside me. This wasn't just a small favor. This was huge. We were already dealing with enough problems between the two of us, and now he wanted to throw two more people into the mix? So you just decided this without even talking to me? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady, even though I was on the verge of snapping. Jake shifted uncomfortably, clearly not prepared for the pushback. I thought about it, but their family, Sarah, they don't have anywhere else to go. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. We were already struggling as a couple, and now he was bringing in more people to add to the chaos. Where are they even going to stay? This isn't a big house, Jake. We don't have room for two more people. They quote, LL take the guest room, he said like it was no big deal. It's just temporary. Temporary or not. It felt like a massive invasion of my space. Our space. Jake, you can't just make decisions like this without talking to me. This is my house too. I'm the one paying all the bills. And now you're telling me I'm supposed to support two more people? He sighed, rubbing the back of his neck like he was already tired of the conversation. I'm paying for stuff, too. I almost laughed. Really? You haven't contributed to the bills in months, Jake. I'm the one who's keeping this house running. And now you expect me to feed and house your sister and her husband, too? How is that fair to me? I didn't think it would be that big of a deal, he said defensively. They need help. I need help, I shot back, my frustration boiling over. I need you to step up and actually be a partner in this marriage. We're barely holding it together as it is, and now you want to add two more people into the mix? You didn't even think about how this would affect us. He didn't say much after that. I could tell he was feeling defensive, but I wasn't going to back down. This wasn't a small thing he had sprung on me. It was huge. How could he not see that? They'll help out around the house, Jake finally said, like that was supposed to make everything better. They won't just be freeloading, I'll make sure of it. I nearly laughed at how absurd that sounded. Help out? Jake, you're not even helping out right now. How are they supposed to pitch and when we're already struggling to keep this place running? There was a long, tense silence. I could see him trying to come up with something to say, but there was no justification for what he had done. He had made a huge decision without me, and now I was supposed to just go along with it like it didn't matter. Before either of us could say anything else, the doorbell rang. My stomach clenched. Is that them? I asked already knowing the answer. Jake nodded. Yeah, it's them. I told them to come over tonight. Of course he did without telling me, without giving me any time to prepare for this new reality. I bit my tongue, trying to hold back the anger that was threatening to boil over. Fine, I said, my voice tight, 
but we're talking about this later, Dad. He nodded quickly and went to answer the door, leaving me standing there, fuming. I couldn't believe this was happening. I was already exhausted from trying to keep our marriage together, and now I had to deal with his sister and her husband moving into my house without any warning. It felt like I was losing control of everything. When Jake came back with Karen and Mike, it was like they were already making themselves at home. Karen looked tired, but neither she nor Mike seemed even the slightest bit uncomfortable about moving in. They greeted me with polite hellos, but it felt forced. There was no awkwardness, no real gratitude, just a sense of entitlement that rubbed me the wrong way to. We really appreciate this, Karen said, sitting down on the couch like she already owned it. We've just been struggling so much with rent and bills. It's been so hard to make ends meet. I forced a smile, nodding along even though I was boiling inside. Yeah, I get it, I said, trying to keep the peace. But in my head I was screaming. How could they be so comfortable just moving into our house like this? Don't worry, Mike chimed in. We'll help out with the housework. And as soon as we get back on our feet we'll find our own place, right? I said, though I wasn't convinced. People always say that, but it never seems to work out the way you hope. Something told me they'd be here longer than they were letting on. And I wasn't sure how much more of this I could take. For the rest of the night, I barely said a word. Jake and Karen caught up chatting about old times while Mike sat quietly like he was trying not to exist. I sat in the corner feeling completely invisible, like my opinion didn't matter at all. It was my house, but suddenly I felt like a guest in it. By the time they finally went to bed, I was mentally and emotionally drained. This wasn't the life I had signed up for when I married Jake. It wasn't even close, and now, with two more people living under my roof, it felt like everything I had worked for was slipping away. Things spiraled downhill quickly after Karen and Mike moved in. The house, which had already felt out of control with Jake's gaming and lack of effort, now felt completely chaotic. It was like Karen and Mike brought a whirlwind of mess with them, and suddenly our home wasn't ours anymore. At first, I tried to be patient. They were family, and they were going through a tough time. I reminded myself of that constantly. I didn't want to be the bad guy, but they didn't make it easy. The house started falling apart immediately. Dishes stacked up in the sink. Their clothes were scattered everywhere, and junk piled up in every room. I couldn't even walk into the living room without stepping over something or moving their clutter off the couch just to sit down. It wasn't just messy. It was disgusting. I'd come out of my office after a long day of work, hoping for some peace, but instead, I'd find Karen and Mike lounging on the couch, watching TV without a care in the world. The place looked like a bomb had gone off. Dirty dishes left on the coffee table, food wrappers crumpled up on the floor, and their laundry hanging around like decoration. Meanwhile, I was busting my ass trying to keep everything together, and they weren't helping. At all. They didn't clean, they didn't cook, they didn't even contribute to groceries. Karen would leave her clothes all over the place, and Mike, who I'm convinced had never cleaned a day in his life, left his socks and trash wherever he felt like it. I'm pretty sure he thought that magical fairies would come and take care of it. I kept hoping they'd snap out of it, that they'd realize how much of a burden they were becoming and start helping out around the house, but of course that didn't happen. Instead, they acted like they were on vacation while I became the unwilling maid. I tried to keep it together. I didn't want to explode and cause tension between us, but I was reaching my breaking point. Jake was no help either. He spent more and more time gaming, disappearing into his virtual world while I dealt with the mess they left behind. I could feel the resentment growing inside me, but I kept pushing it down, telling myself it would get better. But it didn't. It just got worse. Finally, one evening, I'd had enough. I was trying to clean up the kitchen, again after everyone else had gone to bed, and I stepped on one of Mike's dirty socks for the third time that day. That was it. I couldn't keep quiet anymore. I stormed into the living room, where Jake was, of course, sitting with his headphones on, playing his game like he had no clue what was happening around him. Jake, I said, trying to keep my voice calm, but I could hear the edge in it. We need to talk, Dad. He sighed, paused his game, and looked at me like I was interrupting him. Can this wait? I'm in the middle of something. No, I snapped. It can't wait. I can't live like this anymore, Jake. Your sister and Mike are making a mess of everything, and you're not helping either. The house is disgusting. They're not cleaning. They're not contributing to anything, and I'm tired of picking up after everyone. This has to stop. Dot. Jake just stared at me, like I was the one being unreasonable. They're going through a rough time, he said, his voice almost scolding. Can't you just give them a break? A break? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Jake, they've been here for weeks, and they haven't done a single thing to help. You haven't done anything to help either. I'm the only one trying to keep this place from falling apart, and I'm exhausted. This is my house too, and I feel like I don't even exist in it anymore. Dot. Jake looked annoyed now like he didn't want to deal with me. So what? Do you expect me to kick them out? Their family, Sarah. They need help. 
Dot, I quote, M. Not asking you to kick them out, I said, trying to keep my voice steady, even though I could feel the anger rising in my chest. I'm asking them to start acting like adults and help around the house. Is that really too much to ask? Their guess. He snapped back, standing up now, his face red. And if you can't respect that, maybe you should leave. I stood there, stunned. Did he really just say that? Excuse me? I asked, my voice shaking with disbelief. You heard me, Jake said, his voice rising. If you can't handle them being here, then maybe you're the one who should go. Their family, Sarah. I'm not kicking them out because you're being selfish. Selfish. That word hit me like a punch to the gut. Suddenly I was done. I didn't care anymore. I wasn't going to stand there and be disrespected in my own home. I wasn't going to keep sacrificing my happiness for people who didn't care about me. If that's how you feel, Jake, then fine, I said, my voice cold and steady. I'll go. I don't need to stay in a house where I'm not respected. He didn't try to stop me. I think part of him thought I was bluffing, but I wasn't. I walked straight into our bedroom, grabbed a suitcase and started packing. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I needed to get out. I couldn't take it anymore. Jake stood in the hallway watching me, but he didn't say a word. He didn't apologize. He didn't beg me to stay. He just watched as I packed my things and walked out the door. I drove around for a while, not really sure where to go. My mind was racing and my heart was pounding. How did I get here? How did my life fall apart like this? Eventually, I remembered hearing about this quiet, out-of-the-way resort from a friend. It was peaceful, a place to escape from everything. So I drove there and booked a room that night. The minute I walked into that room, it felt like stepping into another world. The soft lighting, the comfortable bed, the silence, it was everything I needed. For the first time in months, I felt like I could breathe. The next morning, I woke up feeling different, lighter, clearer. I picked up my phone and did something I never thought I'd do. I called a lawyer. I told them everything and asked how to start the process of filing for divorce. I didn't want to fight anymore. I didn't want to keep struggling in a marriage where I wasn't valued. I just wanted out. For the next few days, I stayed at the resort, letting myself relax for the first time in a long time. I lounged by the pool, ordered room service, and just focused on me. It felt good, better than I had felt in years. I didn't know what the future held, but I knew I couldn't go back to the life I had left behind. Jake called me a few times, but I ignored him. I wasn't ready to talk. I didn't even know what I would say. All I knew was that I was done with the mess, done with feeling unappreciated, and done with being treated like an outsider in my own home. For the first time in a long time, I was putting myself first. The days after I left felt strange but liberating. There I was, tucked away at this peaceful resort while my entire life back at home was crumbling. But instead of panic, I felt calm, calmer than I'd been in months. I spent my time thinking and planning my next move, and honestly, I didn't feel any rush to go back. Jake kept calling. At first, it was once or twice a day, but when I didn't pick up, the calls became more frequent. I could see his desperation growing. Maybe he had finally realized I wasn't playing around and that this wasn't just another argument. But I wasn't interested in hearing him plead for me to come back. I was done. My decision was made. I had filed for divorce and there was no turning back. When I finally sat down with my lawyer to go over the details, things got messy fast. Jake hadn't taken the news well. Instead of being reasonable or accepting that our marriage was over, he decided to fight hard. His lawyer sent over a list of demands and when I read it, all I could do was laugh. He wanted half of everything. Half the house, half my savings, even a portion of the investments I had made before we were married. It was ridiculous. But here's the thing Jake never knew. I was always a step ahead. He thought the house we lived in was something I bought after we got married. He assumed that because I never made a big deal out of it. He thought I was paying a mortgage just like most people and that he could get a piece of it in the divorce. But he never bothered to ask questions and never paid attention to the details. The truth was, I had bought that house long before we even met. It was fully paid off with no mortgage and it was mine, completely and legally mine. The same went for my savings and investments. Jake thought we were living off my day trading earnings, coasting by on what I made month to month. What he didn't know was that I had significant savings and investments built up over the years all secured before we ever said I do. He had no claim to any of it. The day we sat down for mediation, Jake walked in looking smug, like he was about to walk away with half of my life's work. But when his lawyer started listing his demands, I could barely hide my amusement. When they brought up the house, I decided it was time to drop the bombshell at the house. I said, raising an eyebrow, Jake, you do realize that house isn't part of any marital assets, right? He blinked, clearly confused. What are you talking about? We bought that house after we got married. I smiled, shaking my head. No, Jake. You thought we bought it after we got married, but I've owned that house since before we even met. It's fully paid off, no mortgage, and it's mine. 
The look on his face was priceless. His confidence shattered in an instant as he realized he had no claim to the one thing he thought would set him up for the future. His lawyer started flipping through paperwork, clearly trying to figure out how they had missed this, but it didn't matter. It was the truth, and there was no way they could touch the house that as for the savings and investments, I continued. They were all in place long before we got married. You're not entitled to any of that either, Dad. Jake sat there, speechless. I could see the wheels turning in his head. He had come into this thinking he was going to walk out with half of everything, that he'd somehow profit from the divorce, but now he was realizing he was going to walk away with nothing. I leaned forward, keeping my voice calm but firm. Here's what's going to happen, Jake. You, Karen, and Mike have one week to find a new place. You need to get out of my house. You're not entitled to any of it. If you're not out by the end of the week, I won't hesitate to get the authorities involved that his jaw dropped. One week. He stammered, his voice shaky. We don't have anywhere to go. That's not my problem, I said, not blinking. You've had weeks to figure something out and you didn't. Now you have seven days, or I'll make sure you're out by force. For the first time in a long time, Jake looked scared. He started scrambling, trying to backtrack. Wait, Sarah, we don't need to do this. I'll kick them out. Karen and Mike will leave today. We can work this out. I'll help around the house. I'll do whatever you want. I almost laughed at how desperate he sounded. The fake promises, the sudden niceness. It was all so transparent, but I wasn't falling for it. I was done. No, Jake, I said, standing up. We can't work this out. I'm done. You, Karen, and Mike are out and nothing you say is going to change that. I didn't wait for his response. I walked out of that room, leaving him sitting there, probably trying to figure out how everything had gone so wrong for him. But honestly, that wasn't my problem anymore. That night, I went back to the resort, feeling lighter than I had in months. The weight of everything, the marriage, the mess, the constant stress, was finally lifting off my shoulders. I was free. I was done. Most importantly, I had taken back control of my life. Jake called a few more times after that, begging me to give him another chance. But I didn't pick up. I didn't need to hear it. I had already made up my mind. I deserved better than what I had settled for in that marriage. And I wasn't going to let him pull me back into that life. As for Karen and Mike, they packed their bags and left before the week was up. Jake followed them two days later. And just like that, my house was mine again. It wasn't easy, but it was worth it. I had spent so much time trying to make a broken marriage work, trying to fix something that was never going to be fixed. But walking away, reclaiming my space, my peace, my life, that was the real victory. For the first time in a long time, I felt free. I didn't know exactly what the future held, but I knew one thing. I wasn't going to settle for anything less than I deserved ever again.